hey loves welcome or welcome back to my channel if you are new here my name is faith and today guys i'll be checking out ben shapiro as he reviews the movie opera hammer and you guys i'm super excited as always if you're here to subscribe to this channel please consider subscribing give this video a massive thumbs up comment share and all that good stuff and without much ado let's see what ben has to say in this video well, folks, last week, I turned into a national story because I didn't like Barbie. But I did like Oppenheimer, so let's talk about that movie. Here's my actual review of Oppenheimer. So it's a brilliant film because Christopher Nolan is just amazing. Christopher Nolan is the best living director. There is not a question about this. And um, how you turn a three-hour biopic about a, a nuclear physicist into a blockbuster movie that involves essentially one big explosion is kind of a masterclass. It really is. I mean, just on a filmmaking level, the thing is beautiful to watch. The first hour is so compelling. It's it's the best sort of biopic about science ever by, by a pretty long margin here. The performances are universally fantastic. There, there are tons of cameos by people who you're going to recognize. Aside from Killian Murphy, it turns into a great performance. Obviously, Matt Damon is terrific in this film. It's a really, really, really good movie. What's fascinating about it from a sort of historical point of view is the way that the movie is done. So the movie is is essentially two tracks, what Nolan calls fission and fusion. So the, the fission side is is performed by Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. is um, is playing the guy who's the head of the Princeton physics program who who originally got Oppenheimer to come over there and uh, and who is essentially up for a position as as the head of the Department of Commerce under Dwight Eisenhower. At one point, actually, he was offered to be, this is a real life story, he was actually offered to be chief of staff for Dwight Eisenhower, Louis Strauss. So Louis Strauss knew Oppenheimer. The movie sort of implies that he was jealous of, of Oppenheimer, and that's the reason why he was implacably opposed to Oppenheimer. So the basic thrust of the Oppenheimer story, and this is true in real life, is that Oppenheimer was a communist fellow traveler in the 1930s. There's some good evidence that he was actively being used by the Soviets in like the early 1940s, even during the Manhattan Project, in order to sort of facilitate transfer of information. There's a fairly famous letter from a Soviet agent in the United States to Lorenzi Beria, who was the head of the KGB. It wasn't called the KGB at the time, but the KGB. Um, and uh, about Oppenheimer, implying that Oppenheimer was in fact being used to funnel information to the Soviet Union, or at least hooking people up. There's a lot of controversy about his Soviet ties. The man was like deeply embedded with tons of communists all around him. There were a bunch of people who actually were active Soviet spies who were present at Los Alamos during this period. So basically, the story of Oppenheimer, just on a historical level, is that he was granted a security clearance in order to help produce the bomb. There were serious security problems with him leading up to that, and everybody was worried about it. But they really had no choice because all the best nuclear scientists were all in bed with communists, including, by the way, Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, quite famously, was kind of a fan of Lenin. He literally said about Lenin, quote, I honor Lenin as a man who completely sacrificed himself and devoted all his energy to the realization of social justice. I do not consider his methods practical, but one thing is certain. Men of his type are the guardians and restorers of humanity. Right? That, that is what Albert Einstein had to say about Vladimir Lenin. So, I mean, a lot of these people were communist fellow travelers. One reason for that is because most of Europe at this point was divided between sort of fascists and communists. Right? This is exactly what happened in pre-war Germany is that there, there was a divide between the communists in Germany and the fascists in Germany, and the right sided with the fascists in order to stop the communists, right? That's the story of the early 1930s and late 1920s in, in Germany, and obviously the Nazis end up rising to power. A lot of people who oppose the Nazis then fall into the communist camp because the communists very often would, would promise sort of equality of man and brotherhood. So for a lot of Jewish expatriates who had been victimized on the basis of race, they looked at communism, which suggested equality on the basis of all of this stuff, and that meant that they were trending toward the communist camp. This is why in intellectual Jewish circles, communism was very popular in the 1930s and 1940s as sort of an anti-racist routine, despite its evils. Okay, so Oppenheimer is brought into Los Alamos. There are serious suspicions about his security, even at the time. He's given security clearance to get the bomb done. After the war, he becomes a big, an ardent opponent of the development of the hydrogen bomb. He speaks publicly about how the hydrogen bomb should not be developed because it'll lead to an arms race. Instead, maybe we should share technology with the Russians and there'll be mutually assured destruction and then we'll all go weapons down. And there are two ways to read that. One is, as 
Oppenheimer's fans would read it, which is that he was so stunned by the power of the bomb that now he turns against the use of nuclear weapons and the possibility of, of nuclear weapons themselves, right? I'm the destroyer of all men and the, the, all of the um, quotes about uh, him being, you know, death. And the other read on this is that he was perfectly fine using the bomb on Japan when the Soviets wanted the bomb to be used on Japan. But then as soon as the war was over, he didn't want the United States leaping way, way, way ahead of the Russians in terms of nuclear technology. And so he wanted to stop the development of the hydrogen bomb. And it was these suspicions that led Louis Strauss to testify, uh, to, to essentially organize a removal of Oppenheimer's security clearance in the early 1950s. So in the movie, this is played as sort of McCarthyite scare. Like everybody is, it's, it's overwrought, it's red scare kind of stuff. But again, there's pretty good material suggesting that Oppenheimer probably should not have had security clearance in the aftermath of the war because he was given security clearance as like an emergency measure. But he was a serious, I mean, like literally every woman he ever slept with was a communist. All of his friends were communists. He, he gave money to communist causes. He was cited in a letter that's now been uncovered to Lorente Beria as a person who was used as a funnel. Now, maybe that's false. Maybe it's not true. But is that enough questions to remove a security clearance? It for sure is. The movie plays it as though Oppenheimer is clearly not in that camp. And that the real reason that he's sort of going through this process and respecting the process is because he wants to do repentance for having created the nuclear bomb. The, the real problem with the movie is the time in which the movie is made. So the entire premise of the movie is that Oppenheimer has created a means for the world to destroy itself and he can't actually deal with that. And so that's the entire plot line of the movie. And all of the counter arguments to him, mutually assured destruction. We have to bomb Japan because a million men will die on the beaches of Japan if we don't. The notion that we have to beat the Soviets. All of these are treated as sort of bad concerns. The problem is that history proved all of Oppenheimer's critics basically right. The reality is that nuclear power has been one of the greatest achievements in the history of science. Maybe the greatest achievement in the history of science. Why? Not only because of the development of nuclear energy, which is essentially endless and clean, but also because the development of the nuclear bomb itself has made wartime death extraordinarily less of a, of a mathematical issue. Meaning, that let's take for let's take a quick example. The number of American soldiers who were killed in World War II was four hundred and five thousand. Four hundred and five thousand Americans died in World War II. One hundred and sixteen thousand Americans died in World War One. The nuclear bomb is developed, and here are the casualty lists. Okay, here are the deaths by war of the United States for every subsequent war: thirty six thousand in the Korean War, okay, less than one third the total of World War One. And less than one-tenth the total of World War II. 58,000 in the Vietnam War. These are bloody, long wars, by the way. Really bloody, really long. The Vietnam War is 1963-1975. It's a 12-year war. 58,000 people dead. Again, less than one-seventh the number of people dead in World War II. The Persian Gulf War, 382. The Iraq operations, 4,600. The Afghanistan operations, 2,456. So all of the... So, so some of the people who are played as villains in the film... And, and I, I won't say that they're played as outright villains. The only person who's played sort of as an outright villain is Strauss by Robert Downey Jr. But all of his concerns about Oppenheimer are, are correct. Oppenheimer was a wild egotist. He was a womanizer. He was a person who was deeply involved with himself. And there's a pretty good argument to be made that his sort of narcissism led him to make some of the arguments that he was making. There's a scene that sort of played for almost like Truman is the villain in which Oppenheimer, and this is a real story from American Prometheus, the biography upon which the film is based. There's a, a scene in the movie where, a set where Oppenheimer goes to visit Truman and he is telling him he doesn't want to do the hydrogen bomb and that he's very concerned about the casualties and he says that he is uh, disturbed, but that he's the person who, who created the bomb. And Truman looks at him and he says, you didn't drop it. I dropped it. Nobody's going to remember you for dropping it. They're going to remember you for the science. They're going to remember me for dropping the bomb. And he says, get this crybaby out of my office. Truman was right. Truman was right, okay? The fact is, nobody remembers Oppenheimer for being the guy who dropped the bomb because he didn't drop the bomb. And this is sort of the, the outcome of the movie that's, that's sort of weird. So the, the movie seems to suggest that the scientists have some sort of special viewpoint into humanity because they developed the science. That the politicians are sort of venal and corrupt and they have all these worldly concerns, but the scientists are operating on sort of a spiritual plane. The cult of scientific expertise probably went out of fashion with Oppenheimer, and it's a good thing that it did. Because the reality is that just because a scientist is great at science does not mean they know jack bleep about politics or about human nature. Again, Albert Einstein, most brilliant scientist who ever lived, was a fan of Lenin. Now, Oppenheimer was a communist fellow traveler. And the, the, the fact is that 
Anthony Fauci does not know about human nature. Anthony Fauci does not know what sort of decisions should be made to balance all the interests of human beings. This is why we elect politicians. This is why we don't have scientific God kings. And so the, the there are a couple of messages that come away from the film that are sort of in conflict. One is that it's kind of bad that the scientists you know, didn't get to run things because the politicians were so venal and all of this. But the other one is that the scientists are really kind of screwed up because they're screwed up just like all other human beings. They're not a class apart from all other human beings. They are not wiser or more brilliant, except in the fields in which they are wiser and more brilliant, which includes nuclear physics, but does not include politics. And so in, in any case, the fact that, you know, it takes on all of these issues and does so in a blockbuster fashion, a three hour long movie about issues like politics, science, about the interplay of the two about communism versus freedom of speech and all that. Like the fact that you do that in a three hour film and it's going to make hundreds of millions of dollars is a testament to uh, what Christopher Nolan is capable of. In terms of where this ranks among Nolan's films, it's it's a different kind of Nolan film. Right? It, it, Nolan's films that you think of are like The Dark Knight or Interstellar or Inception, you know, these vast sort of, these vast visual feasts. That's not really what Oppenheimer is. It's more along the lines of say, There Will Be Blood than it is along the lines of uh, his, his prior work. As I say, it's the best scientific biopic ever made. In terms of where I put it in sort of the Nolan pantheon, it's kind of strange to put it in the Nolan pantheon because, again, it's such a different type of film. But um, I will say that I was pleasantly surprised by the fact that it's better than his last two films. So I, I, I wanted to love Dunkirk and said I kind of liked Dunkirk. And I didn't like Tenet. I thought Tenet was a mess. Now, th- this one is, a, it's, it's such a good, fil- it's a film I will watch twice. And uh, that's saying a lot because it's three hours long. Are you tired of the lies and the twists of the mainstream media talking points? Yeah, me too. Join me in my newest series, Fact, where I dismantle and bring truth to this tiring mainstream agenda. Wow, you guys, that was such an interesting review from Ben Shapiro. Let me know what you think about this movie, if you have seen it. And if you haven't seen it, do you want to see it? From Ben's review, I feel like I need to see this movie and because it sound really really interesting already and a lot of intriguing stuff went on in that movie i really really enjoyed ben shapiro's review and if you guys totally enjoyed watching give this video a massive thumbs up comment share and all that good stuff and this is me officially signing out i'll see you guys in my next video bye guys <laughs>